this, uh, this workshop uh, um, has been uh, organized uh, together by CREA and uh, FAO, and in particular by the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO. It's uh, very important to bring together the knowledge and experience that different institutions have uh, in biodiversity and dietary diversity in sustainable agri-food system. This is because it's ever more important and urgent considering the dramatic ongoing environmental degradation. Biodiversity and dietary diversity are strongly related and they are key to the sustainability of agri-food system in terms of environmental and also of nutritional impact. So actually, uh, one of the missions of the Food and Nutrition Center in CREA is to collect and to share Italian national food intake data and the Italian food composition data. And in the last years, uh, we had the pleasure to collaborate ever more with FAO's Food and Nutrition Division in these areas of work. Uh, CREA shared uh, its uh, food consumption survey data with FAO uh, through the FAO WHO gift platform. And uh, we also contributed to the development of the recently published environmental indicators. So now, this memorandum of understanding was signed between FAO and Italian research centers, and this uh, stimulated us uh, to propose holding a workshop on the availability of food intake and food composition data, especially when they are not only at the level of species, but also at the level of varieties and uh, cultivars, uh, so as to monitor food biodiversity. We know that better data are needed for appropriate action. So more data would allow policymakers to better advocate for more production and consumption of biodiverse food within healthy diets. And we are extremely pleased that the Food and Nutrition Division welcomed our proposal to co-organize this workshop and to, in to involve extremely qualified FAO speakers. So now I'm pleased to leave the floor to Mrs. Nancy Aburto, Deputy Director of the FAO Food and Nutrition Division for her welcome address. Thank you, Catherine. Colleagues, uh, uh, students, I've seen some PhD students drop their name in the chat. Um, friends, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm so pleased that you could all join us today. As Catherine said, I'm Nancy Aborto, the Deputy Director of the Food and Nutrition Division at, at FAO, and I'm really pleased to be here to have the opportunity to welcome you from around the world. Um, those of you who are internal to FAO, and of course, those of you from CREA and those of you from other partners that are interested in this exciting topic. As was mentioned, this is a really special workshop because it's targeted to actors across the agri-food system. Um, and it is targeted to people that are interested in food, nutrition, biology, agriculture, and health. So a wide variety. And as we see people dropping their information into the chat, we can see where there's a lot of interest from a lot of different angles. But uh, it's important because data is so critical for underpinning all of the work that we do across the, the agri-food system. Um, but before I go further, I do want to thank Catherine on behalf of FAO. I want to thank the CREA Food and Nutrition Center Director, Emanuele Marconi. I'm sorry that he wasn't able to join us today, but he is well represented. And I want to thank CREA and all of the collaboration um, that we at FAO have had with you for some time now. So it's a real pleasure for us to be able to partner today in the workshop. And the, the, the topic of the data availability on food biodiversity and dietary diversity in both Italy and at the international level is really critical because that high quality data on things like food intake, food consumption, um, diet metrics are needed so that we can capture 
the true impact of agrobiodiversity and other agri-food systems level interventions on diet, nutrition, and ultimately human health. In order to realize the potential link before between these environmentally healthy interventions, such as production practices that protect that biodiversity and human health linked to dietary diversity, we've got to have a really holistic systems approach that links producer and consumer across all of that agri-food system. And it's only through the availability of this high quality data on food intake, on food consumption, including a, a, a food composition, including that food composition on those biodiverse varieties, can we truly monitor our impact and make evidence-informed decisions? And that is what we need, those evidence-informed decisions for us to reach our goal for healthy people and healthy planet. So in that light, I'm excited that we have such an esteemed panel of experts today to share what they know about biodiversity and dietary diversity data in both Italy and globally. So in addition to the CREA colleagues that we'll hear from initially in today's panel, we have three prominent speakers from the Food and Nutrition Division, from the Nutrition Assessment Team that are going to share some of their knowledge and expertise. And I'm just so pleased to be able to introduce them today. We have my colleague, Fernanda Grande, who's going to present to you on food composition of biodiverse foods. She'll also walk us through the importance of including this type of data in food composition databases, including some examples. So walk us from start to finish. We have Victoria Padulo de Cuadros, who's gonna present individual level dietary data intake from the FAO WHO gift platform. And Catherine already mentioned a little bit the importance of that platform. And she's gonna be able to walk us through that and showcase how dietary data on that platform can be useful information for us all. And then finally, we've got Giles Hanley Cook, who's gonna close the round of presentations by discussing diversity indicators collected at large scale globally, very specifically the minimum dietary diversity for women. He'll also tell us a little bit about some ongoing research in this regard around food biodiversity metrics. So we really look forward to hearing from all three of them. I think it's really important today that we take advantage of this unique opportunity. We have the expertise from the FAO colleagues that I just mentioned, but we've also got the expertise from those colleagues from CREA that I can't wait to hear the presentations from. So it's really a unique opportunity for all of us to learn and also have an opportunity to share, share some questions and learn from one another. I think that the sharing and learning will help us collectively be more effective in considering biodiversity and dietary diversity for nutrition and to accelerate those impactful policies and actions across agri-food systems by linking again that, that production side and that demand side in terms of what kind of data we can use to show that connection. These efforts will contribute to our collective vision for nutrition of a world where all people are eating healthy diets from efficient, inclusive, resilient, and sustainable agri-food systems. So I really hope that you enjoy today's workshop. I'm sure I will. Thank you very much for your time today and back over to the team from CREA. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. So um, as you can see from the agenda, today we have two sessions. The first sessions will be with uh, speakers from CREA, and we will deal with uh, dietary diversity and the promotion of human and environmental health, the Italian case. So first of all, uh, um, uh, Marika Ferrari, who is an expert in uh, food consumption data, will give her talk. Thank you, Marika. Thank you very much, Catherine, Nancy, for the introduction and a good morning, everyone. Now I'm uh, okay. Okay. Yes. My yes. My name is Marika Ferrami. I'm a researcher at the CREA Food and Nutrition. My presentation will be on dietary diversity as a means towards more sustainable food system 
and uh, the availability of uh, biodiverse food consumption data in Italy. The definition of a sustainable healthy diet uh, uh, developed by WHO and the FAO uh, on uh, 2019 clearly explain that uh, sustainable healthy dietary partners uh, have to promote all dimensions of individual's health and well-being, have a lower environment pressure and the impact have to be accessible, affordable, safe, equitable, and also culturally acceptable. In addition, a sustainable diet have to support the preservation on biodiversity and the planetary health. On individual's health, the recommendation is that the sustainable diet have to be based on a, varied, a great variety of unprocessed or minimally processed foods, ensuring a balance across food groups. This situation, this condition can ensure to reach a nutritional adequacy of daily food consumption in terms of nutrient coverage according to the requirement and the recommended intakes. More diversity in our diet can lead the farms versus more crop and livestock diversity to support, uh, to reach the optimal food biodiversity that can be defined as a diversity of plants, animals, and the other organisms used for food, covering the genetic resources within and between the species and provided by ecosystems. Dietary diversity we can consider as a number of individual food items of food groups consumed over a reference period and can be measured using the data from the food consumption database of the National Food Consumption Database in two ways. At the household level, the household is a, a group of people, in general a family, that lives together with the same house. Uh, we can find the household dietary diversity score. In general, the, this score reflect, represents the economy ability to a household to access to a variety of food. Uh, an higher score as a, an indicator of increased of economic access to a varied diet uh, for a household member. And uh, the, the score can be measured uh, at the individual level, using uh, a, an individual dietary diversity score. In general, in general this score uh, reflects uh, the dietary quality, the nutritional adequacy, mainly uh, more specific micronutrients adequacy of the diet. Uh, in the activities of the systemic project uh, ENAB on nutrition and food security in climate change context, uh, funded by joint programming initiative of the European Commission, in which CREA was partners, in the action of World Package 3, together the colleagues of uh, Oporto University in Portugal, we developed a variety diet index. Uh, this score was developed from individual food consumption data. And for Italy, we use the data from Italian National Food Consumption Survey, named Irasky 2005-2006, and we elaborate the data from adult population. Um, the index was a modified version of the Healthy Eating Index developed and published by Kennedy et al. And the score definition was based on five food groups, cereal and tubers, fruit and vegetables, meat, fish and eggs together with, for a represent one group, dairy and fats and 25 subgroup specific for each uh, food group. The aggregated forms of the food group and subgroup were performing according to the food X2 classification and uh, harmonized the categorization system 
uh, used uh, from used by FAO and also from uh, the, by Korea. And uh, the variety index aims to measure the variety both within and between food groups. To proceed with the elaboration of the score, uh, we calculate the tertial of the variety index. Uh, the score values uh, were divided in order to three groups, each containing one third of total data. So each participant was classified in one of the tertiary according to today's score. The table show the results in terms of intake of total raw, total raw edible yeah. food, energy macro and macronutrients per day, stratified by variety index score tertiary. And uh, the results is uh, show that uh, the all the, the intake was uh, major in the in the group of uh, the third tertial the daily intake of energy macro and macronutrients increases as the variety index tertial ascend in, for nutritional adequacy we calculate the ratio between the mean intake of the nutrients per day and the reference value as the average requirement stratified by variety index tertials. And uh, the average, we, we uh, consider the average requirements from uh, the other reference value of EFSA uh, because of uh, the same approach was applied also for other uh, food consumption data for the other European country, so it's uh, more uh, possible uh, to, to compare all the results. Uh, we choose uh, uh, micronutrients, uh, vitamin A, vitamin 2, uh, vitamin B6, uh, vitamin B6, and uh, for mineral, calcium, and uh, iron. And, uh, and the results show that the nutritional adequacy uh, improve as the variety score increases for all selected micronutrients that we consider for this study. So there is a correlation with the higher uh, variety index score with the intake of the micronutrients and also with the uh, nutritional adequacy that uh, is uh, improved. Um, the, to proceed with the, for the evaluation on a biodiverse food consumption, then the actions will be to adapt the score using biodiverse food identifying as a cultivars and the varieties of conventional foods in food consumption da data. We are working on that in our last uh, update food consumption data, named the uh, Quarto Sky, that uh, we finished to, log to co collect the data in 2000, 2000, 2020, sorry. And uh, we check for all uh, food group, and we find that uh, the principal group that uh, contain more biodiverse food is the vegetable food group for Italian food consumption data. And we found 60 biodiverse food that correspond to 25% of all uh, food items that uh, present part of this group. Uh, this is uh, just uh, one example for uh, the food items cabbage, we have uh, the consumer the consumption of three varieties as the cabbage green, savoy, and the red. That is a part of a subgroup named the leafy vegetables. For broccolo, we have uh, the consumption of the two varieties like broccolo verde ramoso and broccolo head. Uh, that, uh, and uh, we, we have uh, now to to match our data of consumption of these varieties with the, the nutrient composition uh, in, the, in our Italian food composition table of uh, CREA AN to know how is the intake of this uh, uh, biodiverse food from our data. 
this is a work very important that we have to, to do in the next, uh, in the future, to have uh, all uh, the complexity of the old data with the biodiversity foods. So the recommendation towards uh, a sustainable food system, the recommendation is that it's necessary to investigate, to investigate on the biodiverse food uh, available data in, the, in all national food consumption database at, uh, at the international level. And uh, so we, uh, to understand the impact of a biodiverse food consumption of nutrient adequacy of the diet through the knowledge of the nutrient composition of different varieties that uh, uh, Silvia will be speaking in the next uh, presentation about uh, specifically with uh, this topic. Thank you very much uh, to all for your attention and uh, see you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Marika. I think it will be very interesting to see how uh, um, these um, dietary indicators of diversity um, compare with the one which will be presented by uh, FAO. And uh, I think we are at the first steps uh, of um, measuring dietary diversity at the level of uh, subgroups, and even with the idea that we could reach um the biodiverse foods who knows and uh, and it's also interesting to see the first steps we are doing to uh, assess uh, the consumption mm -hmm. of diverse uh, foods uh, uh, which are still few but uh, we have a lot of uh, more work to do and um and now, uh, please Silvia um, you're an expert in uh, food composition and uh, I think you will tell us more about which kind of uh, data we have at the biodiverse level in uh, food composition, please. Good morning to everyone. Thank you, Catherine, and thank you, Marigan, everyone. Um, so now we are talking about the availability of the biodiverse food composition data in Italy. Uh, so we talk about the data present in the National Food Composition Database of the CREA N. Uh, let's start. Um, food composition databases and food composition tables are the main source of the food composition data. Uh, so provide uh, detailed information about energy, macronutrients, micronutrients, and other compounds present in the most consumed food by a population. Food composition data uh, are uh, important for a wide range of activities and are used by several stakeholders and users as researchers and academics, health policy makers, um, healthcare professionals, consumers, food industry, and um, is uh, very important to, um, to have a good quality of food composition data because food composition data are necessary to assess the nutritional status of the population and therefore to develop public health policies. Uh, many factors can affect the food composition. Uh, for example, as regard plant origin, plant origin foods, the composition can be affected by variety, uh, geography, uh, season, stage of ripening, um, soil composition or technological treatment and, and more. So uh, food composition depends on genotype, environment and on genotype environment interaction, which can explain uh, the differences in same genotype grown in different locations. We can say that among all factors influencing the composition of food, genetic is one of the most important um, because the nutrient composition can differ not only between species, but also within species. Significant intraspecific differences in composition have been well documented, especially in food plants, and this means that eating different varieties can contribute to the nutritional adequacy of the diet. For all these reasons, in recent years, uh, the need has emerged to carry out study on the composition of food, taking into account biodiversity. So consider also food below the species level, variety, cultivar, or breed for animals. 
And also in consider uh, wild food or, um, for example, neglected or underutilized foods. Uh, so it's important to improve food composition database with uh, the, uh, this biodiverse food, uh, mainly the food that are consumed uh, by a population. To assess the availability of the biodiverse food composition data, we consider the Italian food composition tables of the CREAN. Uh, these tables uh, was updated uh, five years ago with the new analytical data, and now contain 900 food uh, classified in 20 categories and 120 nutrients. Uh, this database, uh, as an other database, uh, contains data that derived mainly from a blended sample of each food to have a representative product. But over the years, um, thanks to the big amount of the biodiversity that characterized the heating habits of Italians, some local products and varieties of plant foods have been analyzed and included in the food composition tables. Um, so, uh, taking inspiration from uh, some important documents on these topics, we evaluate the level of biodiverse food. And in the Italian food composition tables, uh, we found uh, 75 biodiverse foods that correspond around the 80% of the total records in the database. Uh, it was not too easy to select the, all these foods for the deficiency in some scientific name, for the ambiguity in the description of some product, and because, as it known, the definition of underutilized foods is very broadly. Uh, furthermore, considering that uh, all the food reported in the database are recorded with common name, code, uh, scientific name, and English name, it is possible to classify the 75 biodiverse foods in five groups. The first group is the group of biodiverse food described uh, with the variety and cultivar reported in scientific name. The second is biodiverse food with variety and cultivar reported in common name and not scientific name. Then we have biodiverse foods described in very generic manner, for example, um, the color, considering the color and wild species and neglected and underutilized foods. Here we can see the number of each foods per group and the corresponding percentage. This 75 biodiverse group uh, foods belongs to five categories, only five categories that are vegetables, fruits, legumes, cereals, and nuts. 11 of these, belonging only to vegetable fruits and nuts, have obtained um, the la uh, label of traditional agri-food products, of a label of protected designation of origin, of a label of protected geographical indication. All these labels uh, testify the stronger relation with this biodiverse food with a specific territory. So if you go to see what are these food, we will find uh, Roman globe artichoke, three Italian chicory from Veneto, pistachio from Bronte, two olives from Sicily, and four garlic agotypes. If you want to uh, go to see uh, how many species um, are included in, the, in all these foods, we, in all this group, we can see that in the first group, so the group of foods that have the description of a cultivar or variety level is scientific name. We will find the several, the several species, but the species with the most biodiverse food um, are Citrus sinensis, Brassica leracea, and Pyrus communis, uh, that have five or six different <clears throat> biodiverse food described under uh, species level. So, for example, we can in the database we can see five um, cultivar of oranges and uh, six uh, variety of uh, brassica oleracea. Um, here I compare the some just some of the food composition data about um, of the six uh, variety of brassica oleracea, 
And um, we can see that there is also a brassica oleracea that do not belong to the first group because it's reported without the variety in the scientific name. And uh, we can see that there is um, some difference, uh, some important difference in the composition, for example, as regard vitamin C. Vitamin C uh, range from 47 milligram percent to 81 milligram percent, uh, but we have um, missing data. And the total dietary fiber uh, range from one gram percent to five percent. It's possible to make uh, all, also a um, comparison in the composition of very local labeled product as uh, pistachio from Bronte. Uh, that here, here is compared with uh, generic commercial pistachios, uh, which also reported in the food composition database. And uh, here we can see that there are some differences in macronutrients, for example, in total lipids, in proteins, and simple sugars. So uh, we can say that this is just uh, the first step to evaluate the level and uh, of the biodiversity in the food composition database of the CREA. And now it's important to improve the quality of the data. So for example, fill the gap, update, and correct some information relating to cultivars and varieties. Uh, now is it possible to compare, for example, our uh, numbers, uh, biodiversity numbers, with the uh, data of the other database that include food biodiversity? And why not to, um, to start a collaboration with scientists um, skilled in these fields? And so, thanks you all for your attention and don't hesitate to contact me. Okay. Thank you very much, Silvia. Um, Thank you. We know that uh, FAO has a very rich food composition data at the uh, biodiversity level. Uh, but we thought maybe for uh, countries who have a food composition table similar to that of Italy, where there have not been uh, till now uh, a lot of focus on uh, uh, biodiversity, it would be useful for them to see the first steps we are taking. And um, since we have people um, participating to this workshop from all over the world, uh, we hope maybe there can even be some uh, collaboration on uh, the beginning of this uh, uh, line of research. So now I'm going to uh, in introduce myself and uh, give myself the floor. So let me share my presentation. So can you see it? Yes? I suppose so. So I'm going to talk about the contribution of uh, food biodiversity to food security, and uh, in particular in the case of Italy. Uh, we want to see if, if there is a relevance for Italy of this issue. So here in this slide, uh, I made a very, very brief summary of uh, what is uh, described in a very comprehensive report from uh, FAO um, in terms of the link between biodiversity and uh, nutrition and food security. So um, when uh, we produce uh, more biodiverse food, we manage to have more stability of food supply. And this is now well known because we know that different varieties uh, have different resilience to biotic and abiotic stresses. So maybe you could have a very bad, uh, a, a very strong crop failure on one of the variety, but you would not have it on all of them. And so this will ensure uh, at least some food and uh, provide stability. And of course, uh, um, the different biodiverse food have different uh, nutrient content. Uh, and so this makes it easier uh, to have the adequacy of the diet in terms of nutrients. Uh, so for these two reasons, more biodiverse food uh, make more uh, food security. So we need to learn from the past. That's important. We need to remember about Irish potatoes. 
The potatoes constituted a very large part of energy intake in the population of Ireland in the 19th century. And uh, it was a unique uh, crop, a full genetic uniformity of um, potato. So it was an ideal ground uh, for the development of a destructive disease, uh, potato laid blight. And this led to an incredible crop flare uh, failure, sorry, and it was called the Great Hunger, with uh, starvation to death in the population. You probably know that many people migrated from Ireland at that time. We have a, another report of uh, FAO, uh, which uh, captures the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture. We all know, I think, that there is uh, continuous erosion of um, biodiversity on, uh, for all forms of life uh, on Earth. But in particular, probably, we are more conscious of uh, what happens for the plants we eat. So in the past and until today, more than 600 plant species have been grown for food. Uh, today, uh, more than 40% of global energy intake comes just from three staple crops, and that's rice, wheat, and maize. So this is for sure an issue. Um, when we go to see Italy, uh, there is a very interesting uh, um, uh, activity uh, done by Bioversity International, which is uh, to create an index report of agrobiodiversity in order to compare countries. So when we look at the Italian country profile, we see that Italian farmers uh, still produce more than 2,300 2, local varieties and uh, with a lot of uh, fruit. And uh, actually, I don't know if it's a specificity of Italy, but um, Italian people are very fond of their biodiverse food. And um, every weekend in many different uh, little villages in Italy, you have uh, gastronomic festivals where you can taste uh, uh, recipes made with uh, local biodiverse food. And here I put one on artichoke. So people are fond of it, which doesn't mean that there is not an erosion. Um, what about food security in Italy? So actually, I must say that uh, uh, for some time I worked in FAO and I never looked uh, at the statistics on uh, food insecurity in Italy because I thought that the main issue were maybe for some uh, nutrient inadequacy. Actually, there is more than 6% of the Italian population who experienced moderate or severe food insecurity. And uh, nearly 2% severe food insecurity. And people receiving food aid in Italy are 5%. So these numbers are huge and um, it's important to know. When uh, we talk about uh, food insecurity, uh, we talk about uh, four dimensions. Um, in, in the case of Italy, uh, the dimensions which are an issue are in particular access to food. In fact, in Italy, usually we don't speak about uh, food insecurity, we speak about food poverty, povertà alimentare. So these are people who have issues to buy food. Uh, another dimension which is an issue is uh, stability here. Um, we had this, the experience uh, during COVID. Some people, uh, due to uh, the decrease of their income, could not have enough money to buy food. And so food aid uh, had to grow. Now, what is going to happen in the future? So every year, there is a publication of the IPCC um, report, 
about climate change. And everywhere, every year, it's more depressing because it seems that the projections made are always lower than that what's going on in reality. And um, in 2022, uh, there was a, spe a special focus on Mediterranean region. This is because uh, Mediterranean region was identified by IPCC as one of the regions in the world where climate change uh, would create more food insecurity. And uh, so there are some estimates of the decrease uh, um, in yields uh, for vegetables, um, up to 45% of decrease, also olives, uh, rain fed weeds. These are only a few examples. So I'm sorry, but I'm not sure if uh, uh, you see, <laughs> if you see my screen. <laughs> I'm sorry that maybe you see my face and I, I don't know how to change this. Never mind. We, see we, see, we do, yeah. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm doing my best to move it. <laughs> but then it comes back. <laughs> Never mind. What's happening with climate change in terms of food security here? We, we are going to have reduced uh, crop production. And uh, this will have implication, of course, for food insecurity in Italy, but it will have implications also in other countries, because uh, some low and middle income countries import micronutrient rich food from Italy. And also there will be implications on uh, food insecurity in Italy from other countries, because uh, we import uh, cereals. So these are really important issues. And uh, what is going to happen is that uh, uh, the fourth dimension of food security will become an issue in Italy, and that's physical availability of food. Not enough food for the population. So what can we do? We want to secure food for the population. What is currently being done uh, is to try and uh, conserve uh, plant genetic diversity. And this is being done through ex situ conservation, like seed banks, but also uh, in situ conservation in uh, research centers. Uh, and this allows to breed uh, climate resilient crops, uh, which have uh, improved level of resistance to abiotic and biotic stress. Something else which is done is that some uh, custodian farmers uh, produce local or ancient crop varieties. So now this slide is more to ask a question. I don't have the answer. And uh, I am a nutritionist. How are we going to prevent uh, food insecurity with the use of biodiversity? If we use uh, those improved uh, crops, uh, it's likely that there will be quite a lot of monoculture to be sure that we have uh, large production. If we want to grow more biodiverse foods, there is an issue of quantities because currently those farmers uh, do not represent a large proportion of uh, agriculture in Italy. So, Actually, this is a question I am asking also to the audience. Um, and uh, maybe we can uh, uh, discuss about this during uh, the discussion session. So um, now um, we already had uh, these uh, three uh, speakers from prayer. I will stop from the vision of my screen. Okay, and um, I hope you will appreciate that these were short presentations because we really wanted to leave a lot of space uh, for discussion and questions. Uh, these can be questions. Uh, we know there are many students online today, but it can be also comments. Uh, it can be suggestions. Uh, from uh, we know that there are many researchers online and also. 
many people uh, in the field of um, uh, agriculture. And, um, and so we thought you can uh, use a chat uh, even to share maybe a publication or something it could be useful. So you can uh, ask a question or comment orally, you just have to raise your hand. Uh, and uh, you can also um, write something in the chat. If uh, anyone has issues with writing in English, you could uh, write it in Italian and uh, we will do the translation. So please, uh, you can begin. Raise your hand or write in the chat and uh, we will try to answer and talk. Okay, so there is a first question. Let me check. Her. Okay, there is a first question for um, Dr. Ferrari and um, about the new Italian food consumption data. Uh, she's asking when uh, it's going to be um, available and if it will be open access. Yes. Uh, the, the updated um, sorry, sorry okay yes the updated food consumption data are uh, available in the EPSA platform where you can uh, download the, the data because uh, our food consumption database the last uh, survey is named the Quarto Sky is a part of a food comprehensive database of EPSA. So in the platform, it's possible to download the, the data in terms of the food intake. In terms of nutrient intake, you have a, it's a need to ask to EPSA directly. And for specific requests, for specific food consumption data, more detail on different categories of uh, food exchange classification, you have uh, to request a request directly to CREA. And uh, uh, we have uh, we have an activities on this uh, uh, that uh, you can ask uh, or you can write directly to our uh, to my groups uh, of consumption uh, survey. Okay, thank you, Marika, for the answer. So let's see if there are other questions or uh, people raising their hands. Okay, so there is a, a question for Sylvia. Yes, I saw here a question about the availability of the meat on biodiversity on uh, breed. Maybe it's for me, maybe it's uh, regarding the food composition tables. Um, about this uh, in the food composition database, we don't have uh, the biodiversity, um, biodiversity data about different um, breed. Uh, so different cut meat, and so we don't uh, deepest the, this aspect uh, in uh, in this study for the moment. Only plant food. Yeah, thank you, Silvia. Yes, indeed, <clears throat> it's true that today in our presentation we talked a lot about. Uh, plant uh, biodiversity and um, also because these are uh, the one for it uh, for which it's easier um, for people to know um, I think when you eat a piece of meat uh, it's difficult for you to know which was the breed uh, you will know that it's bovine meat or sheep meat whereas uh, when you eat some salad uh, mm -hmm. At least in Italy, many people would name uh, the salad at the biodiversity level. They would say, I ate some lettuce, 
for example. So actually that's why uh, you can see that uh, we talk a lot uh, in our talks about uh, uh, plant biodiversity. Uh, I don't know if in the presentation of uh, FAO, there will be more on uh, animal foods. Uh, let's see, you'll be surprised. So, um, yes, uh, Mohamed, uh, uh, you want the floor? So please just unmute. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. I think uh, this workshop is very important, especially when you uh, align this concept with climate change. So having this, uh, let me read my question concerning uh, this uh, bi biodiversity issue. I do know the population is increasing alarmingly for it is expected to reach 9 billion then in the year 2050. So this information may urgently calls to uh, communicate uh, related to biodiversity of uh, different uh, food sources. So when when you see when I see the presentation, it's called, it's solely concerning with plant-based uh, food sources. But as you know, uh, different uh, food sources, especially algae, insects, and uh, um, other food sources are nowadays garnering uh, attention. So did this uh, food composition tables considers those alternative pro uh, alternative protein sources because they the the one which are focused by ipcc in order to reduce climate change and in order to ensure sustainability uh, what is your impression concerning this issue thank you okay thank you mohammed for your comment uh, and then um... Uh, raising the issue of um, sources of protein. Um, I think that uh, in the IPCC report, it's made clear that some sources of animal protein um, contribute to the emission of greenhouse gases more than others. And uh, in particular, uh, bovine meat but also dairy products uh, deriving from uh, bovin. So um, I think I will uh, maybe leave some space to speak about this uh, to um, Victoria Padulo de Quadros, who will talk about environmental indicators uh, uh, in relation to food consumption. And uh, thank you, this is a very important issue. So uh, I was suggested to give the floor now to Bridget, and then uh, Stefania Maurino will uh, will also speak. So, Bridget. Yeah, thanks ever so much, Katrin. Um, perhaps in the interest of time, we can actually move to the second component of the the workshop, if that's okay. Uh, Yes, Stefanio, I'm um, apologies for that, but we will have some further time for questions at the end of this session. So uh, don't leave us uh, and we, we will get back to you. Uh, so my name is Bridget Holmes. I'm leading the nutrition assessment team here within the food and nutrition division of FAO. And I'm pleased to moderate this second component of the webinar led by FAO and involving presentations from three members of my team who will speak about nutrition indicators for biodiversity at the international level. So it's my pleasure to welcome Fernanda Grande as our first FAO speaker to present on food composition of biodiverse foods. Thank you so much, Fernanda, and, and over to you. Thank you, Bridget, for the introduction. Uh, I just want to double check if you can already see my screen. I don't think so. We don't see it yet, no. So let me. Try. 
try to share. Okay, now I can see here. Now I hope it works. Yeah, perfectly. Okay. Thank okay, thank you very much for the introduction. And good morning, everyone. My name is Fernanda Grande, and I'm a nutrition officer in the nutrition assessment team within the food and nutrition division at FAO. And I will now present the importance of including food composition data for biodiverse foods in food composition tables and databases. I will also present the biodiverse indicator for food composition and give some recent examples recent examples of how these data are used at FAO to promote biodiverse foods. So it was already mentioned that it's recognized that we have a global trend towards dietary simplification. And just to give a couple of examples of the 6,000 uh, plant species that have been cultivated for food, only nine crops account for 66% of total crop production. And of more than the 7,000 breeds of livestock existing globally, 26% are classified at risk risk of extinction. So this dietary simplification results in a loss of food biodiversity, which may have negative impacts on food security and nutrition. So now let's see some food composition data to try to better understand this issue. So as already mentioned, different cultivars, varieties, or breeds of the same food can have huge difference in the nutrient composition. So here uh, in this table, we have a few foods that are commonly consumed in Brazil, and we can see the wide range found on different uh, varieties, cultivars, of, uh, for the, the content of calcium, vitamin A, and ascorbic acid. And just to highlight a couple of examples, for sweet potato, we can see that vitamin A ranges from zero to up to more than 3,000 micrograms, and the content of ascorbic acid in strawberries range from uh, 31 to 112 milligrams. Now let's have a look also on a few examples of underutilized foods also from Brazil. In this figure, we can see the calcium content in commonly consumed green leaf vegetables with the blue background versus underutilized green leaf vegetables with the yellow background. In Brazil, kale is known for the higher calcium content compared to other uh, commonly consumed green leaf vegetables, but we can see here that the underutilized leaves, they have similar or higher content compared to kale. So we can see that the nutrient content varies substantially among different varieties, cultivar, cultivars, and also among the underutilized foods in an extent that can make the difference between nutritional adequacy and inadequacy, inadequacy depending on the food consumed. So considering the importance of biodiverse foods, FAO together with Bioverse International and other partners developed the nutrition indicators for biodiversity. In an expert consultation, an indicator on food composition was defined with the aim to encourage researchers to generate and compile more food composition data on biodiverse foods and also to develop a systematic approach to monitor the availability of food composition data for biodiverse foods. So the definition of biodiversity was already presented by the CREA colleagues today, but thinking about foods, what would be the criteria to say that a food could be considered a biodiverse food? So according to the indicator, a, a food composition data may account for a biodiverse food in three cases. So the first one, when the food is described below species level. So it means that we should have information about the genus, species, and additionally, variety, cultivar, or breed information. 
However, it's difficult sometimes to describe the foods as such. And this is why we have the other two criteria. So if we have wild and underutilized foods uh, identified by the local name with the place of origin, we can also account for biodiverse foods. So in an important point already mentioned today, underutilized foods refer to species that are underexploited and thus will vary depending on the geographic area. So FAO and in foods have published a list of underutilized species counting for biodiversity and the last version was published in 2015. So this information uh, this food composition data information is extremely important on biodiverse foods and where should we find this information? So it should be available in food composition tables and databases since these tools centralize detailed information on the nutrient values of foods. They vary across countries and regions, but usually they include information about the edible portion, energy, macro and micronutrients, and sometimes no nutrients. And ideally, they should include uh, information on all foods consumed in the country or region where it was developed, including raw, cooked, processed foods, recipes, and also the biodiverse foods. However, historically, food composition tables are designed to provide representative nationwide values for foods with a more generic description, meaning that biodiverse foods are uh, commonly not included. But due to a global consensus about the importance of biodiverse foods for nutrition and the need for food composition data, we have a few good examples of food composition tables, including data for biodiverse foods, uh, according to the indicator I have uh, just presented. We already saw the Italy, the Italian food composition table as an example, but we also have, for example, the FAO in foods food composition table for Western Africa that includes information on edible insects, crocodile meat, snails, and game meat, just as an example. We also have the Indian food composition tables that include a lot of different varieties for some common foods and the Brazilian food composition table that holds a, a separate data set on biodiverse foods according to the um, indicator that I have just presented. In addition to food composition tables, uh, food composition data for biodiverse foods are sometimes generated, but they are scattered and not widely dis disseminated. And to assist countries to include biodiverse data into their food composition tables, FAO and InFoods have published the FAO InFoods uh, food composition database for biodiversity. This database is a collection of scrutinized analytical data of biodiverse foods from published and unpublished literature, and the data is collected as in the original publication with the only changes made to uniform the uh, expression and component uh, sorry, to uniform the expression of components and the values. The last version has more than 10,000 entries, including data for wild, underutilized, and common foods reported below species level. And the data set is freely available, and you may download the files from the FAO in foods website. Now I want to show you a few examples of how food FAO uses food composition data to improve biodiverse food, to promote biodiverse foods. The first example is the International Year of Millets that happened last year, which was an opportunity to raise awareness to the nutri nutritional benefits of millets since they are resilient to changes in climate. climate. 
FAO reviewed the nutrient data for 15 millet species, including sorghum, covering macro and micronutrients. This information was published in the International Year of Millet's website and in other communication materials. However, we found the challenges uh, we had uh, some challenges trying to find this food composition data. We didn't find information for four species of millet, and one was incomplete, as shown, shown in this figure, highlighting that finding this data may be challenging sometimes. Another good example of food composition data on biodiversity at FAO is the, is the FAO Wing Foods uh, food composition database for fish and shellfish. The current version uh, was published in 2016 and it covers data for 78 fish and shellfish species, including both wild fisheries and aquaculture production for a species of commercial interest from Global North. Now, FAO is working on the update of the database to be published next year, and we expect to include more biodiverse foods, such as small indigenous species, underutilized species, and also aquatic, plantes, aquatic plants. And finally, the last example I want to bring is the vision for adapted crops and soils, uh, known as VAX. The VAX initiative was launched January 2023 in partnership with FAO, African Union, and the Department of State of the United States government to mobilize investments in plant breeding to adapt highly nutritious traditional crops in Africa to climate change. And to identify these highly nutritious crops, food composition data is crucial. So to select the crops, a preliminary work was identified, we identified 174 potential crops. But when we collected data for, uh, when we collected food composition data, we found that for 30% of the crops, there was no data available in food composition tables, highlighting again the challenge of finding data for these foods. To finalize, the main takeaway home uh, message I want to leave are that the nutrient content can vary substantially between breeds, varieties, and cultivars, and thus should be considered when uh, selecting and promoting uh, foods for consumption. And wild or underutilized species and intra-species biodiversity may contribute to the global food security. So the knowledge of food composition data for biodiverse foods is essential to understand their impact on food security and to support informed decisions for policies and programs. So if you want to find more information about food composition and biodiversity, you can find uh, in the FAO Wing Foods website, where you will find all the publications I mentioned here and some training materials on this specific topic. So thank you a lot for your attention and I will hand the floor to Bridget again. Thank you so much, Fernanda. That was absolutely fascinating. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to now welcome Victoria Padula to Quadros, who will present on the recently released environmental infographics and the availability of biodiverse foods in dietary data from low and middle income countries as shared through the GIF platform. Thank you, Victoria, over to you. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Can you see my screen OK? Yes, yes. perfectly. Okay, perfect. So um, I, I will now present briefly about the FAO WHO gift platform and how it provides information on the estimated environmental impact of diets and also the consumption of biodiverse foods in low and middle income countries. Um, Okay, so um, I would like to start by presenting the FAO WHO uh, Global Individual Food Consumption Data Tool, also called FAO WHO GIFT, 
which is a platform that makes existing individual quantitative dietary data from different countries publicly available, with a particular focus on low and middle income countries in which dietary data are less available. All of the data sets included in FAOWHO gift include dietary information collected through 24 hour recalls or food records at the individual level. And with this platform, FAO aims to accelerate dietary data sharing, maximize data use, and create a robust uh, global evidence base on which to develop policies and improve nutrition. So currently there are uh, 54 data sets of individual food consumption surveys available in FAOWHO gift from 33 countries, the ones that we can see in the map. Um, users can uh, visualize some indicators and summary statistics in the form of infographics and also uh, download the data of the surveys for performing um, further analysis. In addition, uh, the platform provides an inventory of existing surveys from around the world, which currently contains uh, 351 surveys mapped. So for each survey, um, details are provided in a standardized format by selecting the, the survey and clicking on survey details. Um, information on biodiverse foods uh, is available for most of the 54 data sets that are currently shared through FAOWHO gift. And this can be accessed in particular through the microdata of the surveys which are freely available for downloading the platform in the form of CSV files. So um, the user just needs to select the survey of interest in the map and click on download data and they can download these um, data files um, with the complete information on the consumption um, of the subjects in the survey. So um, as mentioned, the main focus of FAOWHO gift is to share data sets from low and middle income countries. Um, the data sets shared um, include all foods consumed by the population surveyed, uh, which may include biodiverse and underutilized foods, um, depending on the data set, the context surveyed, and also the level of detail that was considered during data collection. Um, the information of on local foods, um, to use a more generic term, it's usually available at species level, but sometimes also at the variety level. And for all the foods consumed, uh, the data sets available in FAOWHO gift include the regional food names in local language um, or in English, uh, the preparation methods such as raw, boiled, or other cooking methods, the amounts consumed, and also the nutrient values for each food. It is important to highlight that the nutrient values for biodiverse foods depend on the availability of food composition data for that specific food. So in several cases, uh, proxy values for similar foods could be available instead. And finally, sorry, <laughs> and finally, uh, the data sets also contain harmonized food descriptors using FoodX2. So uh, FoodX2 is a classification and description system that was developed and is maintained by the European Food Safety Authority, EFSA. Um, and it was uh, created to harmonize the description of foods in different data sets. Because in fact, the same food uh, can be referred to in different ways in different uh, data sets or contexts. So here we see an example for kaki, or Japanese persimmon, as it, as it is called in the US. And with FoodX2, we can assign an alphanumeric code um, to, this, to this food that allows the classification and description of the food at the same time. And with this, we have uh, a unique FoodX2 code referring to, to the same food, uh, regardless of the different local names um, with which uh, the food is, is known in different contexts. So FoodX2 is a concrete proposal for a common language across databases worldwide, and it's used in all data sets shared through FAOWHO gift. Um, so FoodX2 allows us to identify uh, foods which are the same but, ha but have different local names, 
and it also contains tax, tax, taxonomic names, which enable the user uh, to identify the food items um, when using the system. So here we can see some examples of foods uh, with their local names, their common names in English, and their respective uh, food X2 code and description. Um, since 2014, uh, food X2 has been enhanced for global use through a collaboration between EFSA and FAO uh, with the addition of food items and species that are consumed outside of Europe. So this has made the system more suitable to capture very um, specific species that are consumed around the world. So as mentioned, the, the availability of information on biodiverse and underutilized foods for each data set depends on the context surveyed, the purpose of the original study, and also on the level of detail um, that was considered, considered during the data collection. So some data sets contain only a few local foods uh, while others contain more. So now I just wanted to, to show you some examples um, currently available in FAWHO gift, starting by the Brazilian National Dietary Survey from 2008 and 2009. So uh, this data set contains uh, the consumption of local fruits, vegetables, meat, poultry, seafood, among others. Uh, so not only plant species, and this information is provided at the species level. So here we can see a snapshot of the consumption uh, file of the survey that can be downloaded through, through the platform and uh, which contains the local names of the foods and their um, respective food X2 codes and description. So as we can see, uh, the food X2 description allows the specification of the species consumed. And this information can be uh, used by anyone using the file to identify um, biodiverse foods. Another example is the data set from Benin from 2012 uh, from the Ghent University. And this is an example of a study that was designed to capture the dietary contribution of wild edible plants to women's diets in the buffer zone around the Lama Forest in Benin. And also here we have the original food name and the food X2 description containing the species of these uh, wild plants. Finally, we also have an example from the Cebu uh, Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey from the Philippines. Uh, in this case, we have both information at species level for some foods, in particular for fish species and information at variety level for uh, different local maize grains. So here uh, we have a snapshot of the different varieties of local maize grains um, and their respective local names. Um, unfortunately, uh, the description of varieties with FUDEX2 is a bit more limited as it is not always possible to describe the specific variety but we can capture some differences between the varieties uh, with the use of other food descriptors. So here, for example, we can specify the color of the maize grain, uh, which helps to differentiate between the different varieties. Um, in any case, this is a good example of why the FoodX2 code can aid the harmonization of food description across data sets, but it does not substitute the original food names. Uh, which may contain more detailed information, as in this case. And finally, here we can see some examples of the different fish species that are reported in the Cebu datasets, um, with the respective food X2 description specifying the species consumed. And these are just a few examples from, from these datasets. So now that we saw um, some examples of how the information on biodiverse foods uh, is available on the FAOWHO GIF datasets and how to access it, I wanted to briefly present about the environmental infographics available in FAOWHO GIFT. So as we can see in this slide, um, the platform offers uh, data visualization and statistics on different domains, including nutrition, food safety, and dietary diversity. Um, but in the interest of time, I will focus on the environmental uh, infographics today. 
Um, so although a vast range of data on the environmental impacts of food production is already available, including through FAUSTAT, um, there is a lack of information about the environmental effects of individual um, food choices and consumption. And this information is very important because consumers can be a powerful lever for change through their food choices. And the purpose of the FAOWHO gift environmental infographics is to estimate the impact of diets um, using individual level quantitative dietary intake data. So uh, this uh, first infographic uh, shows the estimated average greenhouse gas emissions, water use and land use of the entire diet and also of different food groups, uh, subgroups and food items per person per day. So this infographic offers an understanding of the contribution of different foods and food groups to the total environmental impact of diets and also how the composition of the diet may influence its environmental impact. Um, currently, uh, the, the infographics, um, the, the values, the estimates are based on a global data set published by Poor and Image in 2018. Uh, which does not contain the environmental impacts of food consumption on biodiversity. So this is an important environmental uh, indicator as well, um, which could be considered for inclusion in the future, depending on the availability of such information in a way that can be integrated into the platform. The second infographic uh, shows the estimated average greenhouse gas emissions, uh, water use and land use of the entire diet per nutritional functional unit. So uh, the functional units are important to describe the environmental impact of food consumption, considering the functions of food, which is to nourish by providing dietary energy and nutrients to the body. So uh, here the results are presented by 1000 kilocalories 10 grams of protein and 100 grams of calcium consumed per person per day. So these functional units are used at normalizing the results. And it's important to consider that they do not intend to reflect dietary energy and nutrient requirements. Uh, more detailed information about the, the methods used to calculate the results and the sources used as well um, are available in the methodology section of the FAOWHO gift platform. So um, some key takeaways uh, are that dietary available in FAOWHO gift contain useful information related to the consumption of biodiverse foods in low and middle income countries and by different population groups. This information can be used to understand the contribution of biodiverse foods to food and nutrient intake, and also to the dietary adequacy of diets. Um, but it's important to consider that the quality and completeness of this information is somewhat dependent on the quality and detail of the data, uh, dietary data collected in the surveys. And finally, uh, the environmental infographics that are available in FLWHO GIFT provide complementary information related to the environmental impact of individual food consumption, um, which can provide evidence to support policies and programs for sustainable and healthy diets. Thank you um, for your attention. And I'll pass the floor to Bridget. Thank you ever so much, Victoria. That was fascinating and, and we'll share the link in, in the chat for those interested in, in taking a look at the, the website. So finally, and last but not least, it's my pleasure to welcome our last speaker today, Mr. Giles Hanley-Cook, to present on dietary biodiversity indicators. Thanks ever so much, Giles, and over to you. Yeah, good afternoon. Can you just confirm that you can see my screen? Yes, perfectly well. Okay, fantastic. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Giles Hanley Cook. I'm a nutrition statistics consultant at the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO. Today, my presentation will focus on dietary diversity and food biodiversity metrics. Now, the construct of dietary diversity has converged on food groups. So, food groups are defined as a set of foods with similar nutritional properties. The premise behind dietary diversity is that 
consuming a wider variety of food groups is more likely to ensure adequate intakes of essential nutrients, so macronutrients, minerals, and vitamins, and meet the requirements of fiber intake and of bioactive compounds necessary for good health. So to illustrate this concept, look at the diet of person A versus the diet of person B. Person A consumes food from a much wider variety of food groups, including cereals, white roots and tubers, vegetables, fruits, and also animal source foods. Person B consumes a non-diverse diet with foods only from a narrow range of food groups. Here, cereals, white roots and tubers, and fats and oils. So person B's diet is much less likely um, to meet their nutritional requirements. Now, the thing is that measuring dietary diversity is often required resource intensive quantitative dietary intake data, but there has been str a strong and rising demand from global development actors for simple, low burden indicators that reflect at least one aspect of a healthy diet. And one of those aspects is dietary diversity. Now, although there are other indicators available, including minimum dietary diversity for infant and young, ch and young children, Today, I will be focusing on an indicator that FAO has over a decade of, of experience working on, minimum dietary diversity for women. Now, what does MDDW in short represent? Well, this is the proportion of non-pregnant women aged 15 to 49 years who consumed foods from at least five out of 10 defined food groups during the previous 24 hours. So this data can be collected using non-quantitative 24-hour recalls. These 10 food groups include starchy staples, pulses, nuts and seeds, dairy and dairy products, meat, poultry and fish, eggs, dark green leafy vegetables, other vitamin A rich fruit and vegetables, other vegetables and other fruits. Now consuming more of these 10 food groups has been strongly associated with higher mean probability of adequacy of 11 micronutrients of public health concern. And this initial the initial studies were conducted among non-pregnant women, as you can see on the left, in, in six low and middle income countries. But since this initial validation, we see that consuming more of these food groups also leads to higher probabilities of micronutrient adequacy among both pregnant women and adolescent boys and girls. And the latter study, so on the right, among adolescents was actually conducted using the rich quantitative 24-hour recall data available on the FAO WHO GIF platform just discussed. The five or more food group threshold was actually uh, defined as the optimal cut point to predict a minimally acceptable level of micronutrient adequacy in almost all of these population groups. So given it is a simple indicator that be, can be collected using non-quantitative dietary assessment methods, um, since its inception, MDDW has now been collected in over 80 countries worldwide. This through data collection platforms such as the Gallup World Poll, the Demographic and Health Surveys, but also through national nutrition surveys. FAO, and as also already alluded to, also uh, presents statistics on dietary diversity, uh, namely MDDW, on its data platforms. So on the left, this is an example from FAO WHO GIFT using quantitative 24-hour recall data from Lao PDR. And here we can see that 32% of women achieved uh, MDDW, so consumed foods from at least five out of 10 food groups the previous 24 hours. We FAO also presents um, data from non-quantitative um, dietary assessments on FAO's, um, on FAUSTAT uh, food and diet domain. Um, so these are always nationally representative estimates. And here, this is an example from Sierra Leone. And you can see that, for example, the nuts and seeds food group was consumed by approximately 30% of uh, non-pregnant women in 2019. Now, healthy diets are of course fundamental to SDG2 and healthy diets include as one of their key subconstructs uh, dietary diversity. And this is necessary of course to end malnutrition in all its form, but also is a prerequisite for achieving many of the other SDGs. However, none of the indicators in the SDG framework specifically capture uh, diet. So given the evidence behind dietary diversity, the, the wide range of data available to us globally, um, a set of UN member states with support from FAO, UNICEF, IFAD, the World Food Programme and the World Health Organization have proposed that the prevalence of minimum dietary diversity by population groups, so among children and non-pregnant females, is integrated as an SDG2 indicator during the comprehensive uh, review in 2025. 
Now, this SDG uh, proposal was submitted only last month, but here I want to highlight um, something that will be occurring between July and August. So there is an open consultation process that allows individuals, government agencies, uh, NGOs, uh, to submit public comments and support for MDD, so Minimum Dietary Diversity as an SDG uh, 2 indicator. So I really warmly welcome anyone that, that supports this to, to, to drop a comment or ask any questions you may have about the indicator during uh, that period. Unfortunately, we won't know the final decision uh, of whether, S uh, whether this will be integrated into the framework until March 2025. Now, as has already been kind of shown by all the other presentations, there is, of course, limitations of focusing only on food groups because this does not reflect the unique nutritional and also eco ecosystem services that are provided by species, varieties and cultivars within food groups. Hence the concept of food biodiversity. So this is the diversity of plants, animals and other organisms used for food, covering the genetic resources within species, between species and provided by ecosystems. Now, when we talk about biodiversity, um, we draw really on, on the work that has already been done in other fields, such as ecology, but also e econometrics, and using metrics that maybe are slightly different than food group diversity. Now, in the interest of time, I won't be able to discuss the wide range of metrics available to measure di diversity, um, but I'll try and illustrate this graphically, these concepts and three key dimensions. So here are four very, very uh, hypothetical diets. They're not realistic at all. Uh, and the distinct species in these diets are indicated by their color. Uh, so, for example, we have maize in yellow, we have aubergine or eggplant in purple. The first dimension of diversity that is normally looked at within the biodiversity literature is richness. And this is very similar to what we see when we count the number of food groups consumed. This is normally a count metric that looks at the absolute number of unique species or cultivars uh, consumed in a diet. So in these hypothetical diets, in the top left, you would say that the species richness of this diet is equal to three because only apple, eggplant and maize were consumed, whereas the species richness of the bottom left diet uh, would be five because additionally beef and uh, chicken were consumed. Now, this very simple count metric has actually been associated. So the species richness of a diet has been associated with a higher mean nutrient adequacy ratios in women and children across low and middle income countries, but also um, consuming a wider diversity of, of species has also been shown to be inversely associated with mortality risk and, and cause specific mortality in nine European countries. And these associations were independent of sociodemographic lifestyle and other known dietary risk factors, including the number of food groups consumed. So this was an independent effect of increasing the number of species uh, of the diet. The second dimension is known as evenness, and this is captured by, and I imagine the ecologists and the agronomists will know these well, by metrics such as Ginny Simpson and Shannon uh, index. So evenness is the equitability of the species abundance distribution. So what do we mean by that? That is how equally, for example, the calories in a, that are a part of a diet are spread across the different species in a diet. So let's take uh, a hypothetical diet again. In the top right, you see that all the species are present in an equal abundance. So there's the same amount of apple as aubergine as maize in the diet. So it is perfectly even according to these metrics. When you look at the bottom left diet, it is very uneven since the diet is dominated by maize. And the last dimension of diversity that is usually looked at within the biodiversity literature is known as disparity or dissimilarity. And this is the level of similarity between species in a diet. So for example, in the bottom right, we can imagine that cow and apple are less similar, both nutritionally and taxonomically uh, than apples, maize and aubergine in the top left. These metrics have been used in a wide range of nutritional epidemiological studies. And this is an example of, a, of how dissimilarity has been looked at using the jacquard distance. So here we see how broccoli, as an example, relates to other food items in the diet. And quite intuitively, they concluded that broccoli is more similar to a carrot than it is, for example, to eggs. And this is based on food attributes, but this can be very an arbitrary selection, right? So this could be based on whether it's a plant or animal food, it's polyunsaturated fatty acid content, uh, but also could, can, could include things like food processing levels. So in conclusion, 
Um, because we need low resource methods, we need simple indicators for timely monitoring and evaluation of dietary diversity at global and national levels, we are likely to still need food group diversity metrics, such as minimum dietary diversity for women. However, if we want to look more holistically at the concept of food biodiversity and look at metrics that cut across nutrition and biodiversity, we need food biodiversity metrics. But these all have limitations, and I won't be able to go to, into much detail about this in the interest of time, uh, but all I want to flag is that they're not all that intuitive um, from through the lens of nutrition. I'll take richness as the most simple metric, uh, and this is because food items belonging to a different food group, such as chicken meat and chicken eggs, are taxonomically regarded as identical. So through a biodiversity lens, they're the same species, but through a nutritional lens, of course, they have very different functions. And of course, um, this does not account into the distribution of foods and the amount of food that is consumed. Um, there are also some statistical issues related to the fact that all these measures have distinct functional units. So richness is expressed in taxa. Uh, evenness is often um, expressed as a probability or an entropy, so bits of information. Um, and there are also non-linearities non non in their changes. So they're very difficult to compare even within the same setting. So the recommendation we have is when looking at this holistic concept of food biodiversity is that you use all these metrics in combination rather than in isolation. And I will drop a few links in the chat uh, with some key publications that really go into much more detail uh, on these limitations and, and the strengths of these indicators. Thank you very much. Back over to you, Bridget. Thank you ever so much, Giles. That was excellent and yeah, a big thanks and, and round of applause to Fernanda, Victoria and Giles for their presentations. So we'll have a short Q&A session now. Um, there's been already some questions answered in the chat, um, but there's one question that, that we thought we could answer here live uh, from an anonymous participant, uh, not willing to give their name. Um, how do you select which which foods are wild and which are underutilized? Um, Fernanda, if that's okay, I'll, I'll hand to you for this question. Yeah, sure. Thank you for this question and thank you, Bridget, for the opportunity to answer this live. So considering food composition information, we will define that a food is wild if this information is included either in the food description, so if we are looking at this information in a food composition table, for example, or if the original source that we are compiling the information from, for example, a, sci a scientific article also states that this food was collected uh, as a wild food and not uh, a cultivated food, for example. While for the under, underutilized species, we rely on the foods that are included in the uh, in foods list of underutilized species counting for biodiversity, which is available for downloading the FAO in foods website. But as I mentioned in, in my presentation, the underutilized species will depend on the geographical area, but also on the social, economical, and also temporal aspects. So this list should be considered as a dynamic list that should change over time. And indeed, some foods could be classified as uh, uh, both uh, in criteria, so underutilized and also wild foods. This can be uh, also a, 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 a common situation since some underutilized foods are um, commonly collected on wild. So I hope this helps to answer the question. Thank you ever so much, Fernanda. That was great. Um, we have another question uh, in the chat. I'm not sure if anybody wants to volunteer to answer this. How can we link food biodiversity with the current demographic nutrition transition and climate change? That's a big question. <laughs> yes, um, maybe I, I have... Um some some inputs Thanks, to provide Victoria. yeah it's not a, a full answer um but i think indeed uh, we need several types of data in order to to see um to make this link um 
so it, in in for WHO gift, for example, we we try um, to provide some some inputs on this through the different um, infographics that we have on the different uh, topics. So um, users could um, look at those different infographics on the env environmental impacts, on the sources of nutrients in the diet, on the food consumption patterns of a population, uh, and also a look uh, through different uh, population groups in the um, in a specific context to to try and get some insights on on this, um, but indeed I think the main um, thing needed is is a way to to link all of the data needed and also it depends on the availability of the data. So I think this uh, indeed we can at the moment um, as a community try to provide some um, information that can be useful to to assess this. Um, but there is no final answer, I guess, for now. Thank you ever so much, Victoria. Um, so I'll just give a, a chance for colleagues to, to raise their hands if there's any additional questions that you'd like to ask our speakers today. Please don't be shy. No questions coming up for now. Um, so we're, we're almost at time. And if there aren't any further questions, um, I'd like to thank uh, the, the panel of speakers that we had today for this, uh, for this workshop. Uh, it's been great to see so many people joining and participating actively in this webinar on this important topic of data availability on food biodiversity and dietary diversity in Italy, but also at the international level. Uh, it was a pleasure for us to deliver this workshop co-organized by the Food and Nutrition Center of CREA and the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO within the framework of the Memorandum of Understanding between FAO and Italian Research Institutes. So while I'm sure you'll all agree there's a need for more and better data in Italy and at the international level, we hope this workshop and important topics covered today will help us all to be more effective in considering biodiversity and dietary diversity for nutrition. So we hope you enjoyed the workshop and wish you all a good rest of the day. Thank you very much, everybody.